Hey everyone, welcome back to a new part of this series I'm doing on converting this 1978 bus to all electric. Well, we're in the dental winter now and it's probably gonna be a couple months before I can actually register this car and get it on the road. So in the meantime, what I'm gonna do is some of the more minor EV conversion tasks. And one of them being is the tachometer. In a previous video, I had added this universal Bosch tachometer into the clock blank of this dashboard here. The problem is I have nothing to run it. So in this video, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a custom speed sensor that's gonna go onto the front shaft of the motor back there that's gonna drive that tachometer. So stay tuned to see how I do it. So a little bit of background for what I'm trying to accomplish here with this tachometer implementation. 15 years ago, in my previous implementation that I've shown you many times before, which was my Spitfire, I purchased this product right here from a company called Recharge Car. This company is defunct and their website's gone and I can no longer find this product. What this product was used for was it worked with any of the neck gain warp motors and it included a ring that would bolt to the front shaft and a bracket that would go around the shaft that had a Hall effect sensor embedded into it. And then a pigtail with three wires. Those three wires went into my old motor controller, which had three terminals that you would plug the three wires from this pigtail into it, which was a positive, negative, and the Hall effect output. And then it had a tachometer output terminal that basically I could wire directly into a standard universal four-cylinder engine you know, tachometer that would normally plug into a four-cylinder engine coil. So I have two main problems that I need to overcome here. One is I lost this item. I don't know what happened, but in between the years of me parting out my Spitfire and starting on the restoration of my Volkswagen bus, I simply lost this thing. The only thing I have left is this aluminum exciter ring that I'll show you in a moment. So that's one problem. I don't have the Hall effect sensor anymore. The second problem is the motor controller that I'm now using doesn't have that feature that my old motor controller had, which had the terminals to plug in the speed sensor and then the, the translation for the tachometer output. So I need to figure out what kind of Hall effect sensor to use and how to mount it to my uh, Warp 9 motor for my VW bus. And how do I translate the output of that speed sensor into a pulse that my tachometer would recognize? So let's get started seeing how we can reverse engineer this. Okay, so on my bench here, I have the one and only part that I haven't lost from that original speed sensor kit is this, the exciter ring. And in all my videos, if I reference a part, I will always provide a link to it in the video description. So you always know where to find it and where to buy it. This will be the one exception. I don't know where to find or buy something like this. But if you're serious about mimicking what I'm doing here in this video, you can leave a comment or send me uh, an email. My channel has my email address on there and I can give you like measurements or the specs of this. But just to describe it basically, what it is is it's a donut shaped aluminum ring and the inner diameter of this fits around the shaft of any of those neck aid motors. It has four equally spaced threaded inserts in it and in each of these in Certs is a steel set screw. So here's a close up of it. If I can get it in the light, you can kind of see. Now, the purpose of these set screws is twofold. Not only do they help secure the ring onto the shaft so that it doesn't slip, but they also, because this is aluminum and these set screws are steel, the sensor is only capable of detecting ferrous materials. So what it did was as it rotated, you would get four pulses out of this because for every rotation, there's four of these set screws. So that helped mimic a four cylinder engine tachometer pulse. So the first thing I did was I thought, okay, well, if I can still leverage this, now what I need is the Hall effect sensor. So initially I bought this, I don't know, it's from Honeywell, this Hall effect sensor, and it's a 12 volt, three wire, Hall effect sensor. It kind of looks like the one in the picture. It's aluminum cased, threaded. It's all potted and epoxy and waterproofed. And it's got the three wires coming out of it, the positive, negative, and the blue output wire. So I thought, perfect. That looks like what was in there. So I hooked this up to my 12 volt power supply and I tried to like get it to detect the steel set screw. 
and it didn't do anything. And I realized what my problem was. This Hall Effect sensor here is made to only detect magnets, not steel things. So if you took like a small magnet like this one here, and I put the magnet near the sensor, then I can get it to detect something. But the problem with this is if I had to use a magnet and I, and I thought about, well, maybe I could remove one of these set screws and epoxy that magnet in there. So then as this rotated, the sensor would pick up one pulse per revolution because it only would detect the magnet. And maybe I can then do some sort of multiplier for that. But then I thought, uh, I, I don't know enough about electrical engineering to know how to do multipliers or anything like that. So maybe I should just find the correct sensor that can detect ferrous materials instead of magnets. So what I ended up doing is I found, I think what the old product was, which was this. This right here is what's called a gear tooth Hall effect sensor. Now this comes in this type of format where it's just a barrel, a threaded barrel that, you know, potted in epoxy. But this version of it looks more like an automotive part where it already has waterproof connection and it's encased in plastic and has a flange with a screw so you can bolt it onto something. This looks like something you would find in an automobile in, you know, today, like as a camshaft sensor or something like that. So I decided to use that. Now, what is the difference between a Hall Effect gear tooth sensor and a regular Hall Effect sensor? This one requires you to have a magnet so that it can detect it, right? This one can do it without magnets, and the reason is is because there is actually an exciter magnet built into it. The reason I know that is because if I try to put the steel set screw against the old one, nothing happens. But if I put it against this one, it actually is attracted to it. So I know that there's a magnet built into this. So that's the difference. You need a gear tooth Hall Effect sensor to make it work without magnetics. Okay, so apparently just getting an automotive grade gear tooth Hall Effect sensor is not the only spec that is important to us. And let me explain that. The other spec that we need in our gear tooth sensor is kind of like using transistor terminology, there's a spec where it's either a PMP or an NPM type Hall Effect sensor. And what that kind of means in layman's term is we always have to have an external resistor to hook it up to, to regulate the voltage. Because what we want is on or off, like kind of a digital type signal. So in other words, zero or 12 volts. And so the, the resistor helps with that. Now this one is the one I was showing you before and it, it is specced as an MPN style, which means the resistor on this will be hooked up between the output wire and the positive, like that. What that ends up doing, and I tested this with my bench power supply here, I have that outputs 12 volts DC. It was giving me 12 volts constantly and when I got the exciter ring, the, the ferrous material near it, it dipped to zero volts. So I think that makes that considered a pull down resistor. I, I don't know the terminology, I don't think that's important, but your 12 volt steady state with zero volt pulses. So that's kind of the inverse of what we actually want here. So I, I'm gonna have to return this one to DigiKey and the one I ended up buying was this one. This is the one ultimately that we're gonna move forward with. Very similar looking device here. It still has that automotive grade flange with a bolt on. It still accepts a 12 volt uh, input. Uh, in other words, it, it actually has the same voltage range of five to 24 volts as the other one, but this one is coded as PNP. And the way you wire this one up, still you'll need an external resistor like this one. In this case, it'll be instead of 2000 or 2500 ohms for this one, this is a 5K ohm. But instead of crossing the positive, we'll cross actually the negative in the output wire and we'll take our reading off the output wire side. What that ends up doing is steady state, this outputs zero volts. And when you get the ferrous material near it, then it pulses to 12 volts, so zero to 12. 
So that's closer to what we want to drive our tachometer. So we shouldn't need any additional circuitry to drive our tachometer with this sensor other than our little pull-up resistor here. So we're going to move forward with mocking this one up in the car and seeing if it actually works with our tachometer. So let's do that now. Okay, so we're back here in the engine bay of the car and I've mounted the sensor here. I was able to find this small bracket here that I could mount to one of these threaded inserts on the motor face. And that gave me a really good, you know, approximately maybe two, three millimeter air gap between the sensor and the exciter ring. Now, this is by no means how I'm planning on mounting it ultimately, where it's just kind of exposed like that. So don't worry about that. This is just for mocking it up and for testing. But that seems to work okay there. I've got the wiring for this tied into this big white wire, this multi-core white wire here, and that's going into my DC command center. And sorry for the sunlight, but I basically got it tied into my ignition panel there on a 12 volt circuit. And I've got the little pull-up resistor between the ground and the green output wire. That green output wire ultimately is going into this terminal strip here. Now, if you have been following my videos, you'll know that this terminal strip I've kind of documented right here, eight of them from the right-hand side are all ones that forward to the front of the car. So notice that I had five and six open and I decided to make six my tachometer feed. So that's gonna be the output of the speed sensor and those eight wires have a corresponding terminal strip, eight terminal strip up, up under the dashboard with all the same wires in that new low voltage wiring harness that I ran under the car. And I'll, I can show you the video up here for that if you're interested. That Bosch tachometer that I have installed in the dashboard is just a universal aftermarket tachometer and its input tachometer wire is wired to that six terminal that corresponds. So we have it all wired up now from the back to the front. So let's go into the cockpit of the car and test it out. All right, so we're in the car here and go ahead and shift it into neutral and we're gonna go ahead and turn our motor on here. So we'll turn on the battery contactors and then we'll do the pre-charge. There we go, we're ready to accelerate here. So I'm about to put my foot on the accelerator and let me get the tachometer here. Let's see what happens. Nice, it seems to work. I think I noticed this on my Spitfire, on my previous implementation, when it's under 500 RPM, it kind of, or under 1000 RPM, the needle's a bit jumpy, but then once it gets above 1000, it seems to stable out. And you can see we can... So that looks pretty good. It looks like it's working as it should. So the next step is to get it permanently installed. I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to do that, but my goal for that is to protect the sensor pretty well and have it cleanly wired inside of the DC command center with the pull-up resistor protected as well. So I'll bring you back in once I figure out how to do that. Okay, a little progress shot here. A little bit of trial and error, but I think this is kind of how I'm going to end up doing it. I just got done hooking back up the sensor and testing it again just to make sure everything still works and it does. So this is kind of the final uh, solution here. It's not finished, but, uh, but this is essentially how it's gonna work. So the way it starts is I went to Home Depot and I bought this four inch round non-metallic, in other words, it's plastic electrical box, commercial grade. So it's nice and thick and sturdy. Now this one has the brand name Carlin and I think they're sold by both Home Depot and Ace Hardware. The reason I'm saying this is because it's hard to find these. My initial implementation was this one, and it's the same kind, but this is only one and a half inches deep, whereas this one is two and a half inches deep. I started by, first of all, cutting off all the mounting tabs, and then to mount it to the motor, what I did was I took my one and a half inch hole saw and drilled out this, the back center of it. And then I drilled a couple holes because there's these two quarter inch threaded inserts around that motor shaft on that flange there. 
And so I drilled the holes for those and I bolted two bolts to that flange and that's what mounts this nice and solid to the end of the motor. Then uh, what I did was I put the exciter ring on and I'm able to do that with the sensor out. I can simply take my pliers and rotate the shaft and tighten in the nuts a little bit at a time just, and, and then I can get them all tightened in even with it being inside of the box there. Then what I did was, since this was a little bit wobbly inside here, this is an oversized hole, I put a grommet inside there that's cut to the diameter of the sensor and the outer diameter squeezes in there so this is in nice and tight. I haven't even bolted it down yet. In order to provide the correct spacing between the sensor and the ring, I did have to grind down the flanged area of this uh, insert on this side so it's ground down nice and flat. And then I had to add a little bit of a spacer in there, a washer there, and that provides a perfect amount of spacing, which is why I had to retest it. Now that I know it works, we can go forward here. Now the one problem I have here is this bolt-on flange. The front cover plate, which I want to put back on, which is kind of nice because then it'll cover the entire shaft and protect everything inside of there. One of the, the mounting holes lines up, of course the mounting holes line up with uh, this so there's a little bit of a, a raised area here so I can't really bolt this straight through what I'm gonna have to do because I don't want to turn it like this because then it'll start dipping down the curvature and it won't line up right what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep it nice and straight and on this just this hole I'll grunt with my Dremel I'll grind down the plastic and make it nice and flat and run a bolt up through to catch the flange and then I'll be able to tie down the flange so it's completely steady but right now even with that gasket in it's nice and sturdy yeah that's pretty much all I need to do and put some blue thread locker on the set screw so I'm going to take it all back off and do the final permanent installation and I'll bring you back in to show you the final result well here's a final shot of the box here as you can see I have the lid all secured on so inside of here, I have the exciter ring. I have Loctite on all of the bolts and they're, all the set screws are cinched down nice and tight. Everything's secured. I've got the bolt run up through here. I've got the, obviously the cover plate on. We're all ready to go. The only thing I'm probably not gonna get done for this video and I'll just have to leave it to your imagination is cleaning up and finishing the wiring. What I plan on doing here is I've got these these harnesses here, these are automotive connectors, and I only have a pack of these two wire ones, which are very common, but I've ordered some three wire ones and it might take a few days for them to come in. But the idea here is I'm just gonna solder the three wire harness, one side of it onto these wires, wrap it in some corrugated tubing, put it into this wiring clamp, and so one side will be right there. The other side will be obviously soldered on and attached to my main wiring harness that'll clip into here and run either back that way and up to the command center or out the side and up to the command center. I haven't decided yet, but that's all I have to do left. So I'll leave that to your imagination. So trust me on that one. And just to verify one last time, we'll give a final test here. I've got the car turned back on and we'll test it out. and everything still seems to work as it should. All the links to all the products that I've talked about are in the video description. And if you have any other questions for me about this, just leave them in a comment and subscribe to see the next video coming up on this car or on other DIY projects that I do. And until next time, I'll talk to you later.